Hi, I'm Annette Pasternak, the Stop Skin Picking Coach, and I'm here to talk to you today about food and skin picking. And this is a presentation that I'll be giving this weekend at the Trichotillomania Learning Center Foundation, or the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors National Conference. <laughs> so um, I will just run through it with you guys. So. Um, just a quick intro for those of you who don't know who I am. Um, before I was stop skin picking coach, I had suffered from skin picking. I have a PhD, you can see here that's in chemistry, and my other letters stand for practitioner of functional diagnostic nutrition, which is something that I also do, which uh, will be a topic probably in a later video. So what we're going to talk about today are, first of all, some general principles of healthy eating because that does affect skin picking overall what you eat. And I'll talk about possible mechanisms for how food affects picking. And then we'll get more specific into specific foods that cause increased picking in a lot of people. And then, you know, how to test the foods whether the foods specifically affect you and your picking because we're not all the same. And then how, you know, with that knowledge, how do you make positive changes in your diet? So first of all, I just want to kind of go through what's known scientifically. Unfortunately, the answer is not much. There is little research on skin picking, period. And there's not that much research on nutrition. And what research there is is not very conclusive or studies contradict each other. Uh, I'll explain part of why that's the case. And there's really, there's absolutely no research on how diet affects skin picking. So this talk, therefore, is going to be based largely on observation. A lot of it's my own observation. Um, with clients, with myself, also some common sense and some, re some extrapolating from research on other similar mental health conditions. So I want to make the point that skin picking and other psychological problems or what's thought of as psychological problems are actually physiological. In other words, they're based in the body, at least partly. And they're a result of two things. We always talk about the interplay of genetics and environment. And there is uh, some knowledge from scientific study that genetics does play a part in skin picking. And you may absolutely have known this already inside your own family because you know somebody else in your family that picks. Uh, very common. But the environment also plays a huge role in whether you pick and how much you pick. So um, environment is determining the extent to which the genes are expressed. So any genes, you know, that are in our DNA, a gene is just a stretch of DNA that codes for a protein. And whether that protein gets made or not, or how much that protein or how much of that protein gets made is determined by a lot of factors and can be controlled by the environment. And, you know, environment, we can talk about so many things, like what's the environment like as, as far as, um, you know, just environmental toxins or the stress of our living conditions or, you know, all kinds of things can be included in environment. Food is a big one of them because that actually creates your internal environment, right? Food literally becomes our bodies, including our brains. So really, how can this not be affecting our minds? Um, some general principles. So food, depending on what we're talking about with food, it can heal or harm. We all have some different metabolic and nutritional needs. So we're all different. You know, we all evolved differently from different parts of the globe. And there's been, you know, great studies on indigenous populations showing that, you know, through evolution, we've thrived on, in whatever environment our ancestors have been from you know, sometimes from thousands of years. So like Eskimos are thriving on a diet of fatty fish and 
um, mammal, you know, sea mammals or whatever. So this is a very different kind of diet than, for example, um, another indigenous group up in the Andes Mountains has almost a vegan diet, and they are thriving on that. And so just the contrast between those two, and then if you switch their diets, they're actually going to get very sick on a different kind of diet. So our cases are not this kind of black and white uh, such a big contrast in the diet, but really, do we even know kind of what we should be eating for our metabolic and nutritional needs? It's kind of, we've gotten all mixed up. So um, just, you know, I'm just saying this to keep in mind that you want to pay attention to the effect that foods have on you and that a diet or even certain specific foods that are healthy for one person are not necessarily healthy for another. So, um, and that's why nutritional research is so complicated because it's generally looking at a varied population and how certain food or a certain type of diet affects them. And so you get real contradictions there. Although there are some general rules. So I like the general rules from Michael Pollan, the author of The Omnivore's Dilemma and other books. So he says, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Pretty much we can all agree that, um, everybody agrees that we could use more vegetables. Like pretty much everyone needs to eat more vegetables. He also says, don't eat anything your great grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. And don't eat anything incapable of rotting. So really all three of these statements are pointing to simply don't be eating these processed foods that have chemicals. They don't even resemble food, really. Uh, food with added chemicals, fast foods. In addition to this, there's a lot of modern agriculture um, practices in modern agriculture that are not good either. So a lot of the insecticides and genetically modified foods, um, there could be problems with those to your health. And so eating organic is a good idea whenever you can. Also, plants are now grown on soils that are pretty depleted of nutrients, you know, on chemically derived fertilizers rather than manure. Uh, and they really lose a lot of their nutrition when the soil is continually depleted of minerals. And also, there tends to be problems with some of the foods that have gotten really hybridized, like wheat has been hybridized to increase the yield, but in the process, the amount of gluten has gone up, the protein in the, the wheat has gone up like 50 times, and that's creating a lot of problems for people. That um, So, and then finally, like animals, Agriculture with animals is not what it used to be like in your great-grandmother's day. And the animals are being fed grains, which is not what they would eat naturally. They would be grazing on grasses and their uh, meat is unhealthy as a result. It's very pro-inflammatory rather than anti-inflammatory, which it would be if they were eating grass. So eating better can translate into less picking. So eating better in general is kind of what we were just talking about um, in the last slide. And why is that? Why does just plain eating better end up with less picking? There's a bunch of possible mechanisms. So one could be that we have increased antioxidation as compared to oxidation. So oxidation is the process by which we get energy from our food. Okay, we breathe in oxygen to get energy from our food. That's an oxidative process. But as a result, there's oxygen around in our bodies that can do damage too. So oxygen reacts like crazy with everything. And so one of the things that can happen, for example, is that the oxygen can damage DNA and lead to cancer. So we need antioxidation mechanisms and antioxidants. And we know that what has the most antioxidants, basically, food-wise, is our fruits and vegetables. So this is also possibly a mechanism against picking, and one of the reasons to think this is 
the effectiveness of the compound NAC or N-acetylcysteine, which there have been studies showing that it does help about half the people who take it against their skin picking, you know, that reduces and they feel less urges to pick. And NAC happens to be an antioxidant. Whether it works by that mechanism isn't certain, but it's a possibility. A second possible mechanism is blood sugar stability. So when, you know, I observe this a lot of times that people who are not eating enough early on or eat early on in the day or eat a lot of very carb heavy or sugar heavy type breakfasts or just really light, you know, just carbs snacking during the day, um, they tend to have more picking at night. And also another thing that points to this being a possible mechanism is that sugar, like I'll talk about a little later in the talk, has a huge effect on picking for most people. Another possibility is that there's less yeast. So this is another possibility for what sugar is doing, that there could be uh, more yeast, especially on the skin, that is causing irritation. Um, there's a theory kind of wandering around out there that the yeast breaks up certain oils on our skin and those um, oil breakup products are irritating and cause us to pick. So that's another possible mechanism. Um, a lower sugar diet will yield less yeast. Another mechanism is just that you're getting more nutrients like vitamins and minerals. So vitamins and minerals, for example, are necessary to make needed compounds like neurotransmitters. So we know that serotonin is low with compulsive behaviors and sometimes giving drugs like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or even um, a precursor to serotonin like 5-HTP. These do reduce the skin picking. And so to make neurotransmitters or to make serotonin specifically, you need vitamin B6. It's a cofactor needed for the enzymes. You need zinc and you need the amino acid tryptophan. So where do you get those things? You know, you get them from food, from good food, <laughs> healthy foods. And another possible mechanism is less inflammation. So inflammation is another one of these things that's, uh, it's a necessary chemical reaction cascade when we are injured. And it's kind of like fight or flight response in that fight or flight is something that's very necessary for our protection, but we don't want to have it activated all the time. Um, and it frequently is like when we're always in a heightened state. And so this is similar, like a lot of times there's just way too much inflammation. And they're really seeing that inflammation plays a part in all kinds of physical and mental health disorders now. So depression is thought to be a possibly a, an inflammation problem. And, you know, when I hear things like anxiety and depression, things that are very often comorbid with skin picking occurring at the same time, um, I think uh, this might have an effect. A similar effect on the skin picking, especially because, I mean, when you're feeling happy and calm, aren't you a lot less likely to pick? Sugar is very pro-inflammatory, so that inflammation really might be a mechanism contributing to picking. So fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables are nutrient dense, so they've got different vitamins and minerals that our bodies need. They're cofactors and enzymes, which allow our chemical reactions to happen. So this is what I was just saying with vitamin B6. This is a cofactor um, for making serotonin and zinc, same thing. And there are also flavonoids in fruits and vegetables. So these are, have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. Have you heard of the expression, eat the rainbow? So when you get, when you eat foods of variety of colors, you're getting a huge variety of flavonoids and they have these great antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties. 
And it has been shown in several large studies now or a handful of large studies that fruits and vegetables improve mental health and um, showing lower rates of depression and anxiety in people who eat more fruits and vegetables. And really when we're, like I said, when you're happier and calmer, we're less likely to be doing the picking. So I think that this is something we can extrapolate to skin picking and say, "Mm, it's probably likely that it is going to help when you eat more fruits and vegetables. And I forgot to mention, I was going to, when we said eating better leads to less picking, I wanted to give you a couple of examples of that just from um, people that have come into my sphere. So I give these half hour breakthrough sessions. Um, If you're interested, go to my website, stopskinpickingcoach.com and sign up for the free gift and you'll get instructions for signing up for a session. You'll get a free session with me. And I always ask people about their diet. And actually, I didn't even have to ask this woman about her diet because she was telling me that she used to pick about a half an hour a day. But six months ago, she drastically stopped her diet or changed her diet. She was eating a lot of fast food and just crappy processed foods and then she went to just a really whole foods diet cooking at home just you know just a more balanced diet and she didn't do anything else to specifically lower her skin picking but she was picking only about five minutes after that a day compared to half an hour so it can have a huge effect another um facialist I know was telling me she used to be a terrible skin picker and just went away. And I was like, really? It just went away? What? Let's try to figure this out. And, you know, when I probed a little further and asked her questions, same thing. She used to be really a, a junk food addict. And then she, you know, stopped eating a lot of, so, drinking a lot of soda and eating a lot of snacks that weren't good for her. And she, her picking really went away to the point where it wasn't a problem anymore. Okay, meat, fish, and eggs are also nutrient dense. So they've got also a lot of vitamins and minerals and protein, obviously, and fats and yeah, th- just a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on there. Here, this is a picture of grains though, basically a meal of pasta and bread. That is not, there are not a lot of nutrients there, okay? Grains are not very nutritionally dense. So just think of this as far as your diet, you know, are you eating an overabundance of these foods to the exclusion of more nutrient-dense foods? So for example, a typical pattern might be cereal for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, and pasta for dinner. And that's not going to be very healthy, Okay, so let's talk about what specific foods and food ingredients can increase skin picking. So I've already alluded to sugar, so and that's number one. Number two, I would say, is caffeine. Um, you know, any stimulant like caffeine or sometimes like um, ADHD drugs. I did another video on that. Uh, these can increase just your agitation and your kind of, um, what is it, fidgetiness or pickiness, uh, and can increase your anxiety as well. Actually, any of these can, sugar as well, can increase anxiety, and that could be, you know, the picking could be a way that you're just reducing or seeking to reduce your anxiety. I think a lot about picking as a way to come to a calm, focused state, It's like how your body has learned it can stabilize itself or it can soothe itself, you know, sometimes emotionally, but also physiologically. Um, So, yeah, the sugar is agitating. uh, And then, you know, you get like high blood sugar for a while and then you get super low blood sugar after the insulin shoots in and into your blood and then um, caffeine can also have a blood sugar response besides being just agitating to your nervous system. The third one is alcohol. 
And alcohol can also, I mean, it can work through a few ways. It can have the blood sugar response. It can be the lowering of inhibitions that alcohol does. And, you know, there's a certain amount that we try not to pick, right? And a certain amount that we can be successful. But then if you have alcohol, you know, there goes the inhibition on the picking. Um, now, if you, some people, you know, if you drink a lot of alcohol, like so much that you would pass out rather than pick, then it would have the effect of decreasing your picking. But I find more typically it's going to increase people's picking and also um, increase anxiety. So sometimes I've had people experiment with not having alcohol, especially if it's something that they've typically had a drink or two, you know, most nights with dinner or whatever. Um, a lot of times they've noticed they give up the drinking and the anxiety goes away almost immediately, like where anxiety was a problem for them. It's not a problem anymore. Okay, so after the big three, which unfortunately these are kind of like the fun ingredients, right? I mean, we really like to indulge in these things. Um, they're in foods that we really enjoy. So it's kind of unfortunate that these also increase their skin picking. Um, okay, so and here's some more. <laughs> here's some more ingredients that we typically love. Now, dairy, this is not one that affects uh, as many people as probably one, two, and three, but for some people it can be um, primary even. It can really be the thing. I've uh, noticed this um, in some of my clients, or they've noticed it rather first, you know, from trying an elimination. Um, so dairy and another one that's very typical is wheat. So these are less common in increasing skin picking, but people have noticed themselves picking more with these ingredients. So dairy and wheat are also pretty common, but there could be other foods that you're sensitive to. And again, like I, I like to think about skin picking as just a way that we've learned to stabilize our bodies. So, you know, yeah, it could be something different. It can be emotional, you know, a way that we like to escape or feel better or avoid uncomfortable emotional feelings, but it can also be a way that we stabilize ourselves. And in which case, anything destabilizing, anything we're sensitive to might trigger more picking. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about examples of this as we get to them again. So sugar, sugar is the big one. This is a picture from my most popular YouTube video. So you might wanna watch this if you haven't seen it already. But I show a few examples like this one. What you're looking at is a graph here of somebody that was in a coaching program of mine last year. I think it was a group coaching. And basically, you know, nothing, this is a record of their picking every day as time went on. And, you know, as they, I taught them more things and they were presumably practicing some things and trying to incorporate changes and trying things out. And really for this person in the picture here, nothing much was working that well, right? At least over the long term, you know, or they weren't really persistent at it. But whatever the case was, you can see towards the end here, oh, oh dear, trying to... Uh, <laughs> I guess I can't use my mouse in that way. Huh. I wanted to point. Okay, but you see at the lower right there, at that point um, where there's like zero picking for many days in a row, and maybe a minute in that little blip, they gave up sugar at this point. I have them do a sugar elimination for a trial period to see, you know, if the sugar does affect them or how. And the large majority of my clients do see an effect. And for some, like this person, it is like the primary thing that works for them. So, you know, how do you tell if sugar affects you? You can do the sugar elimination too. So usually like 10 days is enough time to see if sugar affects your picking. I mean, quite often, it, you know, you can already tell in way fewer days than 10, but it's really nice to see the full effect. 
And so do 10 days, let's say, without sugar. And also, at the same time, it's really helpful to track your mood, to track your calmness, and to track your energy level, because these are things that are also frequently affected by sugar. Now, sugar is bad for like pretty much everything. It's like one of the main things that, you know, contributes to all our chronic diseases. But a lot of people don't realize the extreme effect it has on mood. So, I mean, just like with picking, I think it should be the first thing doctors talk to with patients who are depressed. Um, Same with uh, calmness. Like a lot of times you're going to be a lot less fidgety, a lot less anxious when you eliminate the sugar. And also energy level. Oh my gosh, people have so much more energy without the sugar. So those are some things to keep track of. And I'll, um, in this Freedom Companion that I just published recently, you have the way to tra- an easy way to track those. So I'll show you that later. Um, okay, you want to, as you eliminate sugar, you know, you're eliminating all the obvious things, you know, obviously no soda, obviously no cookies, cakes, things like that, you know, even like granola bars and um, muffins and all those things are sweet. But you also want to eliminate fruit juice because um, although fruit is okay, especially your lower glycemic fruits, you can look that up. Um, Fruit is okay because it's got the water and the, especially the fiber to slow down the absorption of the sugar or the fructose sugar in your juice or in your fruit. Um, but the juice has no fiber. And so it's like getting, you know, it's, it's like drinking sugar as far as the effect it has on your blood sugar. Um, although with some vitamins, dextrose is sugar. This is if you're looking at the ingredients of a uh, packaged food, even though I said, you know, stay away from packaged foods, of course, you know, we do what we can. Uh, glucose, pretty much anything with oats is a no-no. Fructose, there we go. Uh, corn syrup and also high fructose corn syrup, of course. And, you know, while you're doing the elimination, while you're really seeing the effect, I recommend not having natural sweeteners for this time period also. And just a note later on, you know, some of these are better, like maple syrup is better than uh, refined white sugar, but, you know, still could be having a negative effect on you. Honey, make sure it's raw honey. Um, Should be local to your region also for additional health benefits. But the when honey is pasteurized, it's worse than sugar as far as the glycemic effect, how much it elevates your blood sugar. So just note that. Okay, so you do without for 10 days. And trust me, it's harder in the beginning than after a few days, it'll start to be a lot easier. You may get some bad sugar cravings in the beginning um, or whatever, but here you're done on day 11. If you want, you can test it with a sweet treat or two. You don't have to. If you're doing amazing, if you're feeling better than you have in your life or you're thrilled that you're picking so little um, and all that, keep the sugar out. You know, like probably eventually you'll have a birthday cake somewhere or whatever and you can make a note then of how you feel and how your picking goes. Uh, make sure you keep track even after you have some more sugar, keep track of your picking mood, calmness, and energy level for a couple days after that, because sometimes it's a delayed reaction for those things. Okay. Talking about sugar cravings. Okay. So because you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to make it with this sugar elimination if I have cravings? I just a note, so most of the sugar cravings are coming from eating sugar. So, you know, when your blood sugar like goes up and then goes down, you need more sugar. The body's like, and especially the brain is like starving. The brain only eats blood sugar, basically. 
Um, and so it's like, it, you know, the signal it sends out, you will experience as a, a craving for sugar. Um, sugar cravings can also come from not eating enough. So if you are in the habit of skipping breakfast or lunch or eating very lightly earlier in the day um, or just like more carby for the whole day as far as not enough um, heavier kind of, you know, not enough fat in your food and that kind of stuff, that can also give you sugar cravings. Um, so what you really want is to eat regular meals regularly spaced meals that are substantial and that each have some protein, fat, and fiber in them. Okay, so enough about sugar. Caffeine is another one. Um, this, though, you don't want to do a, a really sudden elimination. It's something you want to reduce gradually or you'll experience unpleasant and unnecessary symptoms like <laughs> headache or extreme fatigue. So you can cut it down and notice what the effect is. You know, track your picking the whole way, track your anxiety, and you can see whether caffeine has an effect on your picking. Same with alcohol, just keep track. Um, you can note when you have alcohol on your log. I'll show you again the Freedom Companion because it's an easy way to keep track of these things. Yeah, also keep track of your mood, calmness, and energy because it also can be affected. Okay, talking about dairy products now. So, um, so dairy products affect picking directly in sensitive individuals. And I've had um, probably a handful of coaching clients and seen, you know, some comments on my on my food blog posts, stuff like that, about people who definitely notice increased picking with when they're eating dairy products. And that also you only really notice when you eliminate them and then add them back. And I'm thinking of one of my group coaching clients, her, her case was really interesting, I thought, because so she decided to do what's called the Whole30, which is an elimination diet Pretty much any food that you can be sensitive to, it does not include. So, you know, things that people are commonly sensitive to are grains, are legumes. It doesn't include uh, sugar, alcohol. It um, doesn't include, I think, probably nuts. Anyway, um, so you eliminate everything, all of those things for 30 days. You can look it up at Whole30.com and then you add them back in one at a time and wait a few days to see what the effect is. And so for her, you know, doing Whole30, her picking went way, way down. She's almost not picking at all. And then when she starts to add back in, no problem with um, oats and no problem with you know, something else, and then adding the dairy products in, all of a sudden picking, okay? And then she cut them out again. And I think she had a bunch of picking for two days, and then no picking again, and then down the line she tried adding them back in again, picking again, okay? And what was, I th thought, so interesting about this is that she explained that actually as a kid, they, her doctor had they had either tested her or whatever. They told her she had a sensitivity to dairy products and probably shouldn't eat them. And But she was stubborn and loved it, and so she just kept eating dairy. And, uh, and then really later on had noticed, wow, what a huge effect it had on her picking. Now, besides the sensitivity, dairy can also affect us in our picking through our hormones. So a lot of dairy products can, um, a lot of people get acne as a result of eating dairy and also PMS with worse picking. And dairy products have a huge effect on the menstrual cycle. So a lot of people with cramps, if you just eliminate dairy, I recommend eliminating for at least a cycle and you'll see so much less so much less cramping you'll experience. And even like periods that are irregular will become regular. 
a lot of times when you eliminate the dairy products. So um, that, you know, if, if you do have PMS, if you feel like PMS is a big contributor to picking, as it is for some people, and if you haven't noticed if it is, it's worth keeping track, keeping track of your picking and with your period. And uh, you can tell that. I already mentioned the irregular menstrual periods. Okay, so if you wanted to do that comprehensive kind of elimination strategy, this is really hardcore. So, you know, I know most people don't want to do this. I haven't gotten a lot of people interested in doing this, but you do get to the bottom of the whole thing. I recommend you look up whole30.com. Uh, again, you can get rid of everything for 30 days, add back in one at a time to see what causes a problem for you. And when things are not a problem, then you know for sure they're not a problem and you can eat them again after the 30, after, you know, you add them back in. Things that are a problem, you eliminate them for a while longer, maybe a few months, maybe three months is a good time. And then you um, add it back and you might not have a problem after that period of time. Another option that I like is the 21 day sugar detox. And this is, I'll, I'll put the uh, notes in the bottom of the, in the YouTube description for this. I have an affiliate link for this because I think this is a great program too. And you know, it eliminates more than just the sugar. It is eliminating a lot of the, um, the grains and all that. Uh, but it, it's a great option. They've got you know, audios every day to listen to and emails and loads of recipes. And yeah, it's, it's a good program. Okay. Now the hard part, the hard part is always doing right. Um, making dietary changes, making any changes, right. can be challenging, stressful, and unpleasant, but we're so attached to our diets a lot of times and emotionally even, and some of that could be addiction. So sugar is actually very addictive. Um, four, I can't remember if they said four times or eight times as much as cocaine. Just like, it's very addictive. <laughs> and even gluten and dairy, gluten from wheat and dairy can be very addicting because peptides that gluten and dairy get partially digested into, some of those peptides resemble opioids and uh, bind to receptors and they really are causing you to have a pleasurable response and they can be very addictive too. So what's the solution? How do you change? Um, so you need several things to change. So the first thing is a firm decision. You know, you got to figure out what you want to do and then decide. So if you decide, okay, I am giving up sugar for a period of time or whatever it is, then every time you come into contact with sugar, like say you're at work and somebody, you know, they bring birthday cake or donuts or whatever, you've already made the decision that you don't eat sugar. And so you're not going to be tempted in the same way that if you know you want to not have sugar, but you haven't made the decision to, then every time you encounter an ex a experience like that, it's going to be a new decision every time you'll end up with a lot of micro decisions of like, should I have the cake? Should I not have the cake? You know, or whatever it is. So it's very much easier to figure out and make a firm decision. Uh, you also need a plan. So if you're going to be doing some of these elimination things of elimination diet of foods that you regularly eat, you really need to plan, okay, what are you going to eat instead? So I would plan out, you know, like what are your options now for breakfast and what are you going to, to eat or, you know, any meal or, or midday snack? Like what do you need to bring to work, for example, to make sure you're not going to, you know, be starving or like, uh, you know, only option is the vending machine kind of thing. Then, well, this is sort of related, uh, what you eat for each meal, but just expecting that you're, this is all going to take some time. So you need time to plan and time to grocery shop, um, or, or you're not going to make it, you know, 
Uh, and it takes positive daily attention. So you want to make sure that, you know, you're focusing on the benefits that you are doing this for, you know, like you're doing this, let's say to, to have less picking, to, you know, have clear skin, to feel better, to feel calmer and to feel more energized and all those good things to have more self-confidence, whatever it is, like you want to focus on that because there's such a tendency with changing your diet to like feel deprived of what you can't eat and be focused on oh poor me why can't have that um so you gotta like make sure to focus your attention each day on what you can eat and why you're doing this and then you may also need support and accountability. So this is actually going to be a lot easier to do if you have a friend or a family member willing to go along with you and, you know, also eliminate sugar or whatever it is, do the whole 30. So much easier if you've got, you know, somebody else doing it with you. Um, and accountability, somebody like who's going to not let you cheat or who you're going to be letting down if you cheat on it, you know, because they're doing it too. Um, or accountability can also come through a coach. So that's another way that I help people as a, as a support and a provider of accountability. And the Freedom Companion can help with that too. So this is, this is what the Freedom Companion looks like inside. All the pages are very similar to this. Actually, all the pages are identical except for the uh, quote at the top. There's a different inspirational quote at the top. And of course, in the beginning of the book, there's several pages explaining how to use it and what all these things are. But um, your Freedom Companion can help you keep track. As you can see, you've got the um, towards the top you recording mood, calmness, energy level, and picking, and you can use that zero to ten way of keeping tra track, which I think I might have forgotten to mention. <laughs> That's how you do it. And then, see in the bottom right, you've got your sugar, caffeine, and alcohol to keep track of. And then there's a lot of other great things here. Your morning gratitude and affirmation. This is keeping your focus on the positive, kind of like what I just explained, like keeping your focus on the benefits. This is very similar to that. And uh, just lots of, just a checklist of all the kinds of things that you could do that have the effect of decreasing your picking. And some of them are, you know, what we've talked about, good food. Uh, actually, that's that's really the only thing we've talked about so far. But you do have your so-called vice box in the lower right to keep track of the sugar, caffeine, and alcohol. So besides being available on Amazon.com and BFRB.org, the Freedom Companion is also available in PDF form. You get it as a bonus when you sign up for my online course. So BreakFreeFromSkinPicking.com if you're interested in that. And you know, you can print out as many copies as you want then when you get it as a PDF. So my course is a step-by-step -step system, like it says here, for gaining freedom from the vicious cycle, healing your body and mind, and getting your life back. So it's 10 modules of PowerPoint presentations. So if you've enjoyed this presentation today and you found it helpful, you might like my course. All right, thanks for your attention.